Hello, and welcome to Deprogrammed with Carrie Smith. I am really excited about today's show. I'm sitting here with three lovely ladies who you can already see if you're watching the video version of Deprogrammed. Um, and if you are a fan of Unsafe Space, if you've followed us on that channel, then you've already seen individual interviews with each of these women. I've brought them here today so we can kind of have a roundtable, have a discussion about what it's like to survive a woke mob or a social justice mob as a small business owner. So welcome ladies. Why don't we go around the panel and you can introduce yourself and tell people, I guess, to start just where they can find you online and, and who you are if they're not familiar with you. Marie, do you want to start? Yeah, my name's Marie Buskey and I am the mistress of all stitches at Skeins, S-K-E-I-N-Z dot com, which is an online and bricks and mortar yarn store in New Zealand. And you can find me uh, online at, at that address as well as Facebook and YouTube um, under Skeins. Uh, we have a channel there. You have the kick-ass accent to you brought it today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Jennifer, and I own Ragamuff, Little Ragamuffin, uh, Ragamuffin Patterns and Fabrics. And you can find me at littleragamuffin.com, um, floating around all sorts of social media at Little Ragamuffin. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm a seamstress. I think I'm the only one uh, in the group here. <laughs> so I sew as well, but it's not my business. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that, by the way, just yeah. <laughs> business-wise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And Maria? Um, hi, my name is Maria and I sell hand dyed yarn online. My business is Tuscan Knits and I just celebrated my three year cancel -versary, um about two weeks ago. Wow. Is <laughs> that <Basically> gone? <laughs> and you're still surviving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no. Maria, you, for anyone who's not familiar, you were one of the first knitters we talked to um, because it, for anyone who's not familiar with the social justice mob that happened or the social justice wars that have been happening in the knitting community and the fiber arts communities, um, you were involved in, I would say, could we call it like the first skirmish of those wars? Mm. And Carter and I on Safe Space, we found out about you from uh, Catherine Jepson Moore, who did a series of really great articles for Colette about the the knitting wars can you tell people what's the short version do you tell do you tell people that you meet new people do you tell them what happened to you and if you do do you have an elevator pitch <laughs> <laughs> i do tell people because it comes up pretty often but um so in january 2019 the there was this woman named Karen Templer. She was another knitter. She made these bags for knitters and she wrote this blog post about her excitement to go to India that year. And she said things in her post, like she was, ex um, when she was a child, she had the opportunity to go to India, but it felt like um, getting a plane ticket to Mars. So she said things like this. And then this online mob found out about this post and went after her and started calling her a white supremacist. And they started claiming that like the whole knitting community was uh, white supremacist and we all needed to check our privilege and um, like sit in our discomfort. And um, they, they really were just going after Karen Templer and it was really shocking because our community was kind of like a little utopia, at least in my mind before that. And suddenly like everyone was attacking this one woman and sort of using her as the scapegoat. And it felt really wrong to me and no one was defending her. So, or publicly at least. So I went and recorded a YouTube video kind of basically saying that the people that were going after her were being hypocrites and they were only going after her just to shield themselves from getting attacked. So they, then the mob of course came after me. So it sounds a bit like a witch hunt, the way it in, unfolds. So they kind of, they target, they, they pick a target like Karen Templar, everybody goes after this person 
like you said, a lot of people are afraid to speak up online because they don't want to become targets or they might be quietly supportive of the target, but they won't say anything publicly. And then if you do, like you, come out and say something very, I mean, what you said wasn't even that controversial. It was sort of, I'm not going to be involved in this. Um, then, then everybody picks up the pitchforks and comes after you. Is that the way that you experienced it? Yeah. And it was just, like I said, it was really shocking, I think, to the whole knitting community because it felt just so supportive and like this little utopia before this happened. Like we all supported each other and we're doing collaborations together. And there, as far as I know, there wasn't any drama. I think there maybe was um, a little bit that I just didn't know about, but it was really shocking and no one, no one really knew what to do because because we, this was over three years ago now and being canceled, like that wasn't even in our vocabulary at the time. Um, Marie, um, what about, what about you? How did it start for you? Uh, for me, it started um, more gradually, like it wasn't as sudden as Maria's experience. So we, uh, I'm in New Zealand, so we're at the bottom of the world. We had, uh, our knitting community was very much as Maria described it. It was really it was a great community. There was this beautiful utopia in the community at the time. I worked for a mainstream, sort of, I, probably the largest, well, it is the largest online store. We supplied a lot of yarn to the indie dyeing movement. We had great relationships. It was a really lovely place. And then the Karen Templar cancelling happened. And like ripples on a pond, it came down to us. So they started a lot of these sort of ideations started. So for me, it started with the diversity statements. So after that, everybody had to publish a diversity statement. And I, you know, for me, a diversity statement is the match you have on the front door that says everybody is welcome. So I didn't quite understand that. So I sort of sidestepped that we didn't do that. And um, we copped a little bit of heat for it, but we just, I sort of thought, well, no, that's not what we're about. And then it sort of gradually grew, then um, Maria's cancelling happened, and then uh, Kate Davies in the UK was another one that uh, had a lot of effects for us down here. She's a very popular designer in our part of the world. People love her work. And then um, for me, it really hit home with Nathan Taylor, the sock matician, because Nathan is based in the UK. He's a friend of mine. I brought him to New Zealand uh, to attend and be a headliner at an event that I run. And he is just an incredible, incredible man, an incredible designer. And he was seeing all of this go on in the community and he had uh, started a hashtag called diversity and this is a queer HIV positive man who has worked tirelessly for improving the lives of other HIV positive uh, people and uh, within the knitting community and the gay community so he's done so much good and he saw all of this hate going on so he wrote a poem about diversity using his diversity hashtag. And when he did that, that sort of started the second wave of this canceling. So um, that's when I started to get, I got caught up in wave two. So uh, that's when the, the, the messages started coming to me saying, well, what, what is your position? What is your position on Nathan? What is your stance on sock, sock petition? And it were, was, were these private and public people were trying Both. to get you to go on the record? Both, yes. Yep, they wanted me to go on the record and they said it's your responsibility as a leader in the community here to, to state your position, you need to make your position. And their view on that was, is I didn't get an opinion. This is what your position is going to be. You're either with us, with the cancelling, or you're not. And I refused to do so. I just, I would not make a statement I would not place a position because he's my friend and uh, as far as I was concerned why do I need to make a statement in a position around um, what he is doing up there and it just his his situation spiraled and got really bad very very bad and it really that hurt me terribly and that for me is when things sort of started so I was on a slippery slope 
with uh, the social justice mob within the knitting world in this part of the world. And I still hadn't had a full cancellation, but I was, I'd been cancelled by those who were deep into the ideology and I was sort of on notice with others on the fringe. And I fully severed the ties completely, like my cancel anniversary, my two year um, cancel anniversary comes when I did my interview with you in, in Unsafe. And that I just had gotten to the point. I know, Carrie, I'd talked to you for, you know, we'd communicated for six months prior, and I was just getting to the point where I'd had enough. And it was because COVID had started. And I was all of a sudden seeing those who were being the most vehement around COVID measures were exactly the same people who were yes. being most vicious in the cancelling. And I Do thought, hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? I think I know mm. why. I mean, it's that personality type. They Absolutely. like to control. They like to control others. Yeah. And I truly believe that um, social justice is, um, COVID has been the social justice Trojan horse, particularly in this country where we have a very pro progressive government. They have used COVID policy to actually drive home a lot of social justice agenda and governance and it is made they've used fear and control and uh, authoritarianism to actually push through things that they couldn't do without COVID so mm -hmm. it's been a real win-win if you're in the ideology certainly COVID has been the gift that keeps on giving it's amazing it's an excuse it gives everybody an excuse yeah you know yeah so Jennifer that's that's you know that's where I'm at, and uh, it's you just keep you just keep going. Sorry. So, Jean. what's your current anniversary now from cancelling? Uh, I'm coming up two years. Well, for the interview, two I think it'll yeah. be two years in March. Wow. Okay. Happy cancelling day uh, <laughs> coming up, <laughs> Jennifer. What about you? Why don't you tell people a little bit about your story and where they can find you? Oh, well, the big the big blow up was that good old boy Western shirt pattern during my two-year anniversary but I've come to learn over um, the last couple years because it's my two-year I just had my two-year anniversary in November too so yay two years right um, <laughs> so I've come to learn over the last couple years that it, it actually was um, started back when before I even had my company I was doing pattern uh, pattern hacks on my blog so I would take like um, somebody's pattern, indie designer or whatever, and then I would change it slightly and make something different. And those hacks um, were getting quite a bit of attention and it was somewhat distracting for, for the actual businesses, <laughs> although they were getting a lot of sales from it because I had um, affiliate links. So I could see, you know, people are clicking through my stuff and I'm getting a small percentage and they were, I'm like, I'm free, freely, uh, free publicity for these people, right? but they were kind of mad about it because they were being overshadowed. Um, and I was starting to get banned back then from these, from their business groups. And I was kind of confused about it until one day, one of the owners messaged me <laughs> and just told me she didn't want me anywhere around and that I would never be a pattern designer and like just trash me in this, in this private message. And I was like, Oh, okay. So she thinks I can't design my own patterns. Um, well, six months later, I came out with my first pattern, which was the Vegas sundress. And the second I put out the tester call for that, um, which was, I posted in a couple of different groups, I got hit with spam, 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 all this stuff. I was thrown in Facebook jail for like three weeks. Um, I could only use Messenger. So, and I run all of my pattern tests through Facebook groups. And we had to do it in Messenger. And if you've ever been in Messenger with more than like four or five people, it's a mess. So I have, you know, 30, 40 people testing this dress, <laughs> posting pictures, asking questions. Um, but we made it through. I got out of Facebook jail. I put my pattern out. And shortly after that, there was like another wave of, um, oh, you don't know how to make sleeves because it was a sleeveless dress. So like it was just one attack after another for two years um, until finally someone was like, oh, that good old boy pattern, that's racist. And that kind of that kind of stuck with the community. Um, and I was banished from like everything after that. So it was just this domino effect, I think, for me. So for anybody who may not be familiar with the first interview Carter and I did with you, just to clarify, you had a pattern. It was the name of the pattern for this Western shirt was called the good old boy pattern. 
And when you have testers, those are people who they volunteer to make the the shirt, make the pattern and tell you how it mm -hmm. went. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So and that the good old boy, it's just a men's Western shirt. Um, and the, yeah, you're right. The testers, they just, they volunteer to test it so that I know it fits, you know, sizes 14 to, you know, 4X or whatever men, wherever we end there. So I, I, I physically can't <laughs> sew it for myself and say, oh yeah, this is going to fit a guy that's got like a 50 inch chest. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a guy. So I have people test, same thing for women. Um, and they're volunteers. They don't get paid or anything. They just willingly uh, want to test it because they enjoy it. It's, it's fun. So yeah. one of the things I found most just unbelievable about your mobbing was that it seemed to be a large number of white women, which is it usually is in these online social justice mobs, in my experience, mm -hmm. uh, white women who were accusing you of being racist because they didn't like the name Good Old Boy or saying the name Good Old Boy was racist, even though you had testers, volunteers, and models, these women's husbands who modeled the shirts, who were men of color. And yeah. that didn't seem to matter at all. Yeah. And that's why I was so, I was so confused. Like it was the most like insane thing. I'm like, why, why? Like, it doesn't make sense. The pattern had been out for a year or something before that anyways. And I'm like, so all of a sudden this is happening and they're calling me these names. Um, and I'd come to find out that it, it was generated. Um, I don't know who exactly started it. I don't know who started it, but there's a video <laughs> of a woman who's sending, she says, white women, go get her. So that's why I, part of it, there's so many white women doing this to me because she, you know, sent them out there and she told them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really bizarre. But when I look back, it didn't make sense. Well, for one, it's not true. Like none of it's true. So obviously it's confusing. It doesn't make sense. But then just the past history and everything that I went through prior to that was, it was just leading up to something. And that's what, that's what they kind of like the Joe Rogan thing. Like, I don't want to get off subject real bad here, but no, this is currently they were, unfolding. So yeah, they were going after him for this, for that, for the other thing, for the next thing, nitpick, nitpick, nothing was sticking until they're like, you're racist. And then boom, mm -hmm. like everybody starts dropping like flies. And that's what happened with me. It was my two year anniversary. I was having a big giveaway. It was like day four of, of the month of giveaways and boom, ragamuffins racist. That's literally what they were racist ragamuffin, like all these things. So did and, all three of you get called racist? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And I that mean, is that the is, that's, oh yeah. Being, being a racist is like the, the biggest sin in, in the world right now. Like that is the one thing. So that's of course, yeah, the one that sticks. Mm -hmm. And can you, uh, whoever wants to jump in here, it, it, I, I really, if there's anyone going through a mobbing right now, whether it's somebody who's high profile, like a Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. or if it's someone who has a small mom and pop online business and they're currently facing this, this is the kind of thing I, I want to be able to send out to people. Can you tell if somebody's going through this, what's the emotional journey like? for someone who gets publicly accused of these things. Where did you start and where are you now? Do you want us to go around and tell or? Yeah, whoever wants to jump in. You okay, start, Jean. <laughs> yeah, so like the initial reaction is just like, what the heck, and you're confused. And after that, it's like rock bottom. Like I was like, that's it, I'm done. My business is done. Um, I was chatting with, a friend at the time who was also an admin for my group. And I was like, that's it. They got me. That's it. I'm done. And she's like, you have to apologize. And I was like, well, forget that. Like my first initiation was, or uh, first thought was like, just don't apologize. Cause I didn't do anything wrong. I was like, they're going to take me and I'm going to go away <laughs> and that's it. Um, but I thought about it and I was like, you have to think, you have to stop. You have to stop because social media moves so fast. So you have to take a minute. You have to take a day, two days, a week. It doesn't matter. It's going to keep going. They're going to keep going whether you say something immediately or not. Nothing's going to get worse. The information's out there. Whatever they're going to do, they're going to do it regardless. Take your own time. Decide what you want to do. Decide if this is an apology-worthy thing. Because sometimes it is. There's cases where people really do screw up. 
or if it's just phantom nonsense. If it's phantom nonsense and they're making this stuff up, don't apologize. Do not apologize. I'm going to jump in here because I like that you did that. I saw I, that's one of the things when I first saw what was happening to you. I, I really appreciated your sincerity because you said, okay, I'm going to listen to all these accusations of racism and the, the, the name of my pattern. I'm going to consider it and I'll come back and let you know. And at first they took that. I saw some of them took that as a victory over you, that an apology was forthcoming. But then you came back a few days later and you said, not apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. I did my due diligence and, and just, no, it doesn't apply. Yeah. I don't agree. But you yeah. considered it. I did. I even started to, I even, I was in Photoshop and illustrator and I had a uh, different power. I was going to name it the rambling man um, instead. And, and I just got sick as I'm, ty I'm typing this and I'm changing stuff and I'm like, this is, this is messed up. Like I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not doing it. So then that's when I went back to my admin, we had this little side chat and I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And she's like, there, you have to. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you just have to, you have to trust your own heart and your own gut. And if you in your inside are not that person that they're making you be, or that they're saying that you are, then it's not irrelevant. And you lose all self-respect if you just go and grovel and say, I'm sorry. Like, I don't think Joe Rogan's racist. He just came out and he's like, when you have to say, when you have to come on TV or whatever and say like, I'm not racist, you've messed up. No, you didn't, you didn't mess up. Like <laughs> they're forcing you to do that, you know? It's that hostage situation. They have you, they've got you mm. tied down and you feel like there's nowhere else to go. And that's the easiest way out. That's the thing, it's the easiest avenue. To apologize and try to put it behind you is the easiest avenue, but it's not the right avenue. In the moment. Yeah. I think it's the easiest. Yes. It looks like yeah. the easiest avenue in mm -hmm. the moment. Because you want it to stop. You just want it to go away. You want it to stop. But long term, it makes you their pet now. You're mm -hmm. owned by them now if you choose that route. Um, Maria, what, what was that emotional journey like for you at the beginning to where you are now? Oh, it was really, really horrible. Um, because I was one of the first, there wasn't really, I, I felt like I was very much alone. Um, so the first, the first like two or three weeks were really bad, where it's just like hundreds of emails every day, like hateful emails. And then, like Jennifer said, you you kind of feel like maybe you should say something, maybe I should come out with some sort of statement, like saying that I'm not a racist and a white supremacist and trying to explain myself and stand up for myself. But the more you say, the more they have to feed off of. And it's like at that point when they're so focused on you and so obsessed with you, anything you say, they're gonna pick apart like crazy. So, um, I didn't really say anything after that happened. Like I didn't even reply to YouTube comments. I replied to one comment and this totally proves the point. Um, I was just feeling a little bit satirical. So someone asked me in on my YouTube video, how do you get by crying all those white woman tears? <laughs> and, and so that's the one comment I replied to and I said, um, I just like to drink a pint of Guinness just to, to feel better. So they took that one comment and found out that in 1930s Germany, uh, Guinness what? supported the Nazis like for the Olympics. And so they found these old Guinness posters. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, they will find anything. And my husband and I just read through the whole book of Luke in the Bible. And there's a part where Jesus is in the temple talking to the Pharisees. And they keep trying to get him to talk. Like they just keep asking him all these questions just, just to find something. And it, it, it reminded me of going through that. Like they, and they keep asking you questions. They keep trying so hard to get you to speak. Um, and it's really, really tempting. Um, but yeah, those, those first few weeks were really bad. And then 
Um, and then I kind of got a bunch of support shortly after that. After like two or three weeks, I started to get a lot of support as the story kind of um, got out there and there were articles written about it. So that was really helpful. Um, and I got a lot of support through my business, people buying my yarn. But then I realized because I was now this pariah, I no longer had the ability to do collaborations. No one wanted to be associated with me. So it felt like there was nowhere for me to go. Like the following I had is what I had. Um, I was no longer gonna be able to grow my business. So that was really depressing. <laughs> um, and then you guys on the Unsafe Space channel found me and I gained a lot more support. And that was really great. Even just having people that weren't knitters hearing the story and coming in and supporting me and having that community was really important. But um, it's it's been like very up and down emotionally because it's still, people don't really want to be associated with me. And I also don't really want to be associated with anyone else because I'm worried that like any collaboration I do, something's going to happen. And there's going to, there's this like weird tension and I almost just don't even want it in my business anymore. Um, and it's, it's been emotionally very up and down and I've wanted to give up on my business many times and just move on and start over fresh because knowing um, what I know now, if this happened to me again, um, I would completely ignore it. Just completely mm -hmm. ignore. Like I learned this, this phrase the other day, posting ghost. So it's just when you put out a post and then you basically just ghost it and just let people, <laughs> if people want to argue in the comments, like let them just stay focused on what you're doing and just keep going and ignore the drama because it goes away so much faster when you do that. I uh, I want to, I'm, I'm taking notes here. If we were to compile a list for people who find themselves in this situation. So Jennifer, you were talking about how at the beginning you took a break, like took mm -hmm. a break, take your time, collect yourself and figure out what you really want to do. Don't go based on impulse yeah. in that moment. Yeah, emotions. Emotion. emotion. Yeah. And then number two, you're saying post and ghost, which <laughs> I kind of like. Um, <laughs> And as you're talking, you're actually reminding me of, we compare, um, uh, Carter and I compare a lot of, of the way that social justice operates to psychopathy now. Uh, we've been talking about it in that way and, and, and talking more people like Josh Slocum on the Disaffected podcast about personality disorders and um, the way that you're talking about not responding or go ghosting is reminds me of the advice I've gotten about psychopath individuals is the gray rock, which I'm not always the best at. And it sounds like maybe there, it might be a benefit to just gray rocking when this happens. Um, Marie, can you answer that same question? Like kind of for somebody going through this, what can they expect emotionally? What's it feel like at the beginning and what's some advice based on where you're at now? You've, at the beginning, particularly if you've never experienced it before, it feels like a thousand voices are all yelling hate, nastiness and bile at you all at the same time. And if you, you know, you know you're a good person in your heart, to actually experience that, you then have a lot of feelings of self-doubt and, and, and you get, I mean, I got very emotional. I know I cried many tears because I'm like, I'm not any of these things that they say about me. This is all lies, you know, and it's, and it attacks, I think, the absolute fundamental, it goes right back down to the, the fundamental part of your nature and your psyche. And so you know that these things aren't true. So you, you do feel, it's, it's like a flight, fight or flight response. And Jen's right, you've actually got to take some time and step back. So which I did as well and I got some advice we um, we'd had a couple of uh, big pile-ons and I we sought advice uh, from someone independent and 
the advice that I got, one piece of advice that I got, which was really valuable, was actually quantify. Quantify those voices. Because in a country like New Zealand, where it's quite small, and the community is quite small, you often have a number of people with a number of different profiles across a number of different platforms, and they're all actually the same people. So I did a lot of quantification, and we actually started realizing that there was patterns evolving on who these people were. There was ones that were more vocal than others that would uh, post or comment multiple times on multiple platforms, saying the same thing again and again and again. And it may feel like that those are all separate individual people, but they're not actually. They're, they're, they're one person or just a handful of people. So once you realize that, then you can... Actually, that ghosting is the other piece of advice I got is do not engage. Do not engage. And and that's what we did. Uh, so I've never apologized, ever. Never apologized, especially if, as Jen said, especially if you've done nothing wrong. Uh, so don't apologize and don't yeah, and do not engage. And I also too am very, very fond of the ban block delete. Because particularly in these online uh, environments, you've got to remember that these are your nests. These are your homes. You've created these online environments, these online communities. These are yours. So you are the mother bird in that nest and you protect that nest. And if someone's going to come in and shit in your nest, they, they're out. They, they are not welcome anymore. And... I know that you will often have these communities and they'll have all of these rules and guidelines. And I've seen communities that are um, particularly not around a business. So mine is around a specific business, but a general Facebook community, especially. And they will have these rules and you will have people that will come in and they'll, they'll say, oh, well, no, you need to get a warning or you can be stood down. And they go through this convoluted process in these general communities if you don't obey the rules. Well, realize that if this is your business, this is your house. So those rules don't apply. If they're in a general group out there and they're saying, oh, you can't ban or block or delete me because, you know, um, I haven't had a warning or you haven't said that. No, you can do what you, you please. This is your space. Own it. And do be not, don't be afraid to own it. So you don't have to engage with them. You just get rid of them. When you said, you said ban, block, and leak, is that the phrase you used? Ban, block, delete. Delete, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. And so, that's, so, and, that's, yeah, that's, so, that's what I did. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, no. That's what I did. I think I banned like, or blocked like 80 people. And that's what I tell my uh, promoters and my testers when they go out. I was like, if you encounter one of these morons, you just let them say something, yeah. let some other stupid people like their comment, because then you have more people you can block and delete out of your circle and there you go and after a few minutes or a day you just go in delete the comment delete the person uh block and ban them and they're they're having a great success with that um and they're not getting attacked anymore because they're the the few people that are doing it are being silenced we're silencing them from us you know so there's only have happy people and only positive people responding mm. which brings other happy and positive people to respond even more yeah. So, and yeah. and we like I have a, a community, a Facebook community that's about four and a half thousand, and I protect that community myself and, and the other um, moderator. We protect that because that is our sacred space for people to come into and literally forget about the world for a while. And all they want to talk about is knitting and crochet and yarn and design and all of those things that bring that community together. It's the glue that holds that community together. And I have, there's no talk of anything other, no COVID talk, no politics talk, no nothing. This is why you're here. This is the focus of why you're here. It's a very clear purpose. We keep it that way. And every now and then I can tell when one, I mean, I the nickname for the social justice uh, team or people that come after me, I just call them the fan club. Every now and then someone in the fan club will infiltrate and they will try and stir something up and post something, say, did you see what Marie posted on her private Facebook page or um, she's a supporter of XYZ person. The minute I see that, fan block delete. No gone. second chances. You're gone. Mm -hmm. See you later. Yeah. You're not welcome here anymore. I like this advice. And 
if we could talk about it for just a second, it, because somebody like myself who came from the social justice world, so I left, I saw a lot of these mobbings unfold years ago before they hit more, before they hit knitting, before they hit more of the mainstream. I saw them unfold mostly in sm the smaller like feminist groups. So um, uh, the feministing community, which was an early feminist blog, um, the uh, Amanda Marco, there were all these different feminist bloggers who were prominent and then mobs would develop around the prominent ones. And much like you've seen how this works, a lot of it's fueled based on resentment. Then there are charges of privilege and racism or, or some kind of other kind of ism. And then everyone attacks and pulls this person down and then other people get pulled into it. If they, if there are a few people who refuse to, to take a stand then they get pulled down. Anyway, I saw, I saw a lot of these things happening when I was, when I was, um, in that movement. And so having left it, it wasn't just about changing ideology for me. It was about changing behavior. And I wanted to be really careful about not creating another echo chamber for myself. And so if you're coming from that world and if you're like me, you're probably going to have this fear at the beginning of blocking people. I didn't want to block anyone. I, I resolved. I thought I'm going to be in behavior so different and I'm still I rarely block people, but there is a line and I've been, and I, after a few years now of doing our show on safe space, I've gotten to that place of better understanding what you're saying, Marie, which is that there's still room for me to have critical voices in my social media, but critical voices who are coming from a place of good faith or at least partial good faith. Um, and not simply people who are there to shoot arrows mm -hmm. and to destroy only people who want to build, even if that building is critical and we, and they're, they're criticizing to make, maybe help, help me make my arguments better or discard points of views of, of mine that are wrong. Great. But if they're there just to destroy or try to destroy me, then it's, you're out. Like I, I've gotten to that place now of understanding that, no, it's okay to block those people. Um, yeah. And, and the other thing, too, I think that a lot of these um, people doing the attacking forget is that we are the three, we're running businesses. So we're not there as private individuals sharing our private thoughts in a digital world. We're actually uh, running a business. So I don't have a huge present, a huge footprint on social media outside of the business. I just don't. I, um, I have small communities that I am part of but for me because I spend so much time in social media for work I t tend not to spend a lot of time in social media away from work so I uh, I actually live now since all of this in a state of bliss, blissful ignorance a lot of the time mm -hmm. um, in the last 24 hours there's been a huge flare-up within our local community centered around me um, which has made me laugh because I thought I was losing my touch. It's been months. Uh, they're back, so it's good. But I, I was, I was actually quite unaware. But I have people around me who are wonderful, and they, they know that I don't want. You know, I, I keep this high wall garden. I do. Things got very so bad with me to a point with certain individuals that I do have an active police case open with a. Um, uh, a number, like a case number attached to it, which I have specifically that if one of these days, potentially a line will get crossed. So I need to have that there, but I don't need to engage in it. I don't need to know about it necessarily. I have trusted people around me that keep an eye on the community. And if there's anything that they believe um, is evidentiary worthy, they, they file that away um, just in case. And I just, you know, it can go on and I, that's fine because what I know now after, you know, probably three years that I've been tolerating this, two years since I've been cancelled, is that are any of these people my core customer? Are any of these people shopping for me? I have any of these people shop for me recently? Are they going, likely to come back and shop for me? Are the people that live that in the echo chambers that they spend their time in, are they going to be shop with me? And the answer to that is no. So, I'm not going to waste my time engaging and spending any effort uh, trying to have this group of people like me or like my business based around their worldviews 
I'm going to concentrate on the core message of the business that we have, which is bringing top quality yarn, top quality natural yarn at an affordable price and actually concentrate on the audience that want that yarn. And, you know, they don't want to listen to any of that stuff either. They're sick of it. They've had enough. And that's why I never bring any of this into my work life. I never bring any of it into my social media. It's never mentioned. Um, every now and then I'll get a troll on a live video um, in the community and they will say, go away. And I'll just get rid of them. Because as far as I'm concerned, look, you, you can say what you want. You know, you have your entitlement and freedom of speech. But I also have the entitlement to protect the space that I have. So say what you want in your environment, in your spaces, and fill your boots. Because I don't care. I really don't care. And once you get to that point, it's actually, once you get to the point where you can speak your truth and you can do your work and it doesn't, you don't get that heart palpitation, that racing, those sweaty palms, and you feel like you're a failure, then you know that you've transitioned through and it will come. It definitely will come. It's an amazing place to be. Maria, did you have something to say about that? Um, well, I was just going to say, um, I don't know if we wanted to talk about the Blocked magazine, but this magazine came out um, about a week and a half ago. And like Marie said, like I was so just kind of unconcerned about any negativity from this that I, li I, I literally forgot that this had been published. It was published on a Friday and I forgot that it was out there in the world and my article was in it for the entire weekend. Like I was fishing with my husband and just completely like oblivious and it was great. And then I came back to work Monday and looked in my messages and saw there was a little bit of drama, but it was like, I just, I, it feels so good to reach that point where you can just actually forget and get back to your, your real life. Can, can I say something about um, part of your response as well, which I think, I think is good for people to hear is to have a sense of humor about it or try and keep your sense of humor. Don't let them take that away from you. And you illustrated that, Maria, I thought pretty well with your, uh, you had you put out a new line of yarn. Do you want to tell people about that a little bit? Yeah, it was about a year after I was canceled. I decided to release this collection of yarn called Polarized Knits. And I named the colors after all of these phrases and words that I've been hearing in the last year, like emotional labor, problematic, woke, um, sitting with your discomfort. <laughs> so, and I released this whole collection of yarn, just sort of making light of all these phrases and words that I've been hearing. Um, and that actually, it felt like taking back a little bit of the power away um, and mocking them. And I don't think they quite knew what to do with it. Like I really didn't get a whole lot of pushback from it because it was funny and I wasn't attacking anyone in particular. And I think that's another, something that, that's really important to me personally is when I use humor is to not go after any one individual using that humor. Um, and just make light of the concepts themselves, not the actual bullies. You also, to that point, um, with that, that line of yarn, you also named some things after it was, it was a lot of buzzwords that social justice people use, but you also named some after buzzwords that conservatives use like virtue signal. Did you have virtue signal or something like that? Yeah, I had a virtue signal and purity spiral and woke as well, which I don't think the other side really uses woke, do they? <laughs> uh, it's kind of like social justice. They used to use it. And now because their critics have really mainstreamed it, they are trying to move away from it. But it yeah. originated with the woke, just like social right. justice warrior did. Yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah, so, it, was, it, was so, it was supposed to just be humorous and kind of unbiased. Um, that was really successful and fun. So I'm going to throw out another question just for the whole panel and whoever wants to jump in first can do it. But uh, what are some of the lessons that you learned or what's something that you you wish you had known at the beginning that hasn't been discussed yet? Like what's something that you wish someone had told you before this happened to you? I think probably that it's not all real. Like it's real to them, but it's it's a lot it's a lot more real to them than it is to you, if that makes sense. So they and it's often it feels really personal, like really, really personal about, you know, here, but actually it's not. It is they are um so much of it is parroting. So they you will have one person that will state sit have stay state something and post it and then it gets parroted down the line again and again and again and again and when you sort of realize that that it's actually more about them spreading the message of their ideology and less about what it is that you've actually done then that actually makes a huge difference and it took me a little while to figure that out like I just sort of thought I, I really did have a huge period of self-doubt it's like, am I really this horrible person? And when actually I realized that I'm not that horrible person, this is they are using me as a vehicle to continue on spreading the ideology to, to other people and sort of set me up as an example of what not to do or set you up as an example to other people saying, if you follow this person or speak your truth like this person or stand up like this person, we will come for you. So it's really a veiled threat. And once you actually, so that for me actually made me quite determined to keep going and not only keep going, but thrive and show others out there that actually cancelling isn't the end. And in fact, cancelling is not the end at all. Cancelling is a beginning, not an end. And if once you know that and once you actually can thrive, it makes a massive difference. And I'm actually going to let it out a trade secret now. Every time they do something like this, we it actually, from a financial and business perspective, is really good for our business, not detrimental, which is what they believe is the purpose. That's amazing because, and I'm sure that's, if you're watching this and you have a small business and you're like, this is just now happening to you and you're it's impacting you negatively, I want you to hammer that home because people may see that at different points along the journey, but I truly believe that if you stay authentic to who you are and you pursue the truth, you can be successful despite this having happened to you. And so you're saying it didn't, it didn't impact your business negatively. No, we saw what I call a self-selection of people within our social media sphere. So a number left by choice. So we lost followers, but not as many as, I was led to believe that we would lose. Uh, we lost some followers. I culled a lot of followers uh, because of how, you know, their reactions within our spaces. And then what we started seeing is whilst we saw a dip, a very short-term dip in uh, those social media spheres, we didn't see that um, on the balance book at all. And there are a lot of very quiet people out there who are voyeurs in social media, they're aware, they see, they read, and they won't engage. But what they will do is, is they'll engage with your business and they will order because that's their little way of saying, you know, actually we do support you and we're going to continue to support you. And those are the people that I want to talk to. Those are the people when I'm in my spaces, I deliberately stay away from all of this stuff because they are there because they don't they don't want to hear it. They don't want to be part of that. They they just want to enjoy their craft. They want to have it as, 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 a, as a safe space for them. And you just have to stay focused on that. So I stay well away from bringing any, I mean, because sometimes it's tempting, you know, when you've got a platform and you just want to go, and you can't, you just can't. You've just got to 
keep talking about, you know, isn't that new set in sleeve style for this summer going to look amazing? So <laughs> you just have to keep. But that's what your company's there for. Yeah, exactly. That's the and purpose. that's why they tune in. Yeah, that's yeah. the purpose. And you've got to keep reminding yourself of that. As much as you want to retaliate, you've got to keep reminding yourself why it is that you're there, which is why Maria's yarn collection was so genius because it actually covered both bases. It's a way of sort of actually having that purge, but also being able to, you know, do something really positive and funny and, um, yeah, be positive to your business too. So I had like, kind of a kind of an opposite view than what you just said um i don't engage directly with these people but when they do something really stupid i make it public and i kind of make fun of them uh, especially on twitter that's my favorite place to do it and but i don't have a lot of my sewing people on that platform it's just more for me to make fun of them there um but i do on instagram a little bit in my stories and stuff when things pop up and it just makes them aware like other people don't think you're cool. Like there's a lot of people that think you're an idiot <laughs> for saying these things and doing this stuff. Um, and that kind of has put a barrier between me and them for a while. Um, they don't even engage with me anymore. And in fact, somebody sent me a screenshot not that long ago, I think last week or so. And it said, yeah, don't engage with little ragamuffin because she doesn't even believe any of this stuff and she won't even, and you won't, I feel bad for any POCs that try to go up against her or some, all this nonsense. So they, they specifically won't even engage with me, which is fine, perfectly fine. But um, I think I've put that, put that wall up enough now. I've built that wall up strong enough and they know that I'm not going to take any of their crap and, I'm, and I am going to respond. And I always respond if I do. I hopefully do it gracefully and respectfully and nicely. And I'm not a jerk or anything, but... Um, but I just kind of put them in their place and they have nothing left to say, you know, when you tell them that they're wrong so nicely. <laughs> you know. What about something you, at the beginning, that you wish you had known? That I wasn't Or alone. is there anything? Because that was the hardest part. The hardest part was actually doing the right thing, thinking you're the only one that thinks it's the right thing or the only one that's going to um, be there you know, other than my family and whatever, like I, I thought it was over and I didn't, thankfully what I do doesn't feed my family. You know, like what I do is just, it's almost nonsense. Like <laughs> it's grown and it's wonderful, but it, it's, it is what it is. Um, so we're not reliant on it. So I, I have that as it's freedom, you know, like I don't have to worry about paying the light bill or anything from what I do. Therefore, I did have the freedom to just be like, you know, go away. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You guys are wrong and I'm not apologizing. Um, but it was still that like community because I had been part of for years, years, years before even starting my own business. And this, then this was two years into my business. So I was probably six, seven years into the sewing community that I felt like these people that I know through the internet and some in real life, but these people that I know that I've come to be uh, friends with, that I've done collaborations with, that I've, um, supported and promoted for other businesses, they're all going to go away. And that, that was a loss that I was willing to take, but it was really hard to do that. Um, so knowing that you're not alone and when you stand up for yourself, <laughs> the amount of love that just comes swarming outweighs all the negative. And then the new people like Carrie, like, oh, it's just so amazing. Like Unsafe Space picking it up and everything was just I, I don't even have words. Like, I, I just love you guys, all of you. Um, because again, it just like, that's what fills the gap. The feeling of loss is going to be full of joy and hope in a matter of time. You know, sometimes it takes a little bit. Um, it's two years, just over two years since my cancellation event or whatever. And I'm starting to see actual new growth because I was just like flatlined for a while. I didn't really lose. I only lost like couple hundred members in my group. So I, not much, but I'm almost, you know, seeing more growth now, which it takes time. It takes time. Um, but yeah. And Maria, just what about you? <laughs> Are you fine lady? Okay. Um, I think for me, like at the very beginning, I wish, um, I didn't have anyone at the time, but I wish I had had someone 
reading all of my comments and emails and messages. Um, my husband isn't really into computers and being online or anything. So he wasn't really um, a person who just stepped up and did something like that. But I know that like Nathan, his husband basically read everything. So Nathan didn't have to actually see the things himself. So that would be really helpful if you have someone in your life who's willing to do that for you, a family member or spouse or a friend. Um, I did kind of leave Instagram when that first happened. And I had like, there were kind of people behind the scenes, like taking screenshots of things and sending them to me. So I have like a whole folder of horrible things like they were sending them to me in case I ever needed them for some reason. Um, so I had like random people doing that, but yeah, if, if you can find someone who can do that for you, that would be super helpful because like Marie said, it feels like thousands and thousands of people just like clamoring at you with hate. Like, like you're on the scaffold and people are just like yelling at you and throwing things at you and bruising you. And like, it just feels like you're being tortured. Um, so it would like, just if you can take a break, have someone else go through all of that for you, if you need, um, just stay offline. <laughs> it, I didn't, um, but then again, I, I do feel like I was one of the first ones that this happened to and I didn't know what to do. And like, it's so hard to take your eyes off of, off of these things. When people are saying things about you behind your back or just denouncing you, like psychologically, like you want to know what these people are saying and it's really bad for you and you don't need to see these things at least not for like, for me, it would have been nice if I didn't even see them for months and months later. Um, Cause yeah, it just, it's really, really overwhelming. And like one morning I woke up and opened my email and of course it was full of a bunch of crap. Um, and I read one that was from a friend um, and I just immediately went to the bathroom and threw up just from the, the stress and all of the hate being um, piled on me. So yeah, that'd be my advice. Just try to get away and have someone else deal with that if you can. And I think too that too, that the hardest thing is when you have people, like I know um, all three of us have heard that, you know, people you collaborate with, people that you've worked with, um, the ones that hurt me the most are women who I'd, had worked with for a number of years had attended my event who had you know I had supported um you know we'd supported each other you know through so many things and growing our businesses and all of those avenues and once they felt that I'd crossed this invisible imaginary line they just completely backed off and some of them I mean yeah same thing I I've got emails which I've kept from people who I considered good friends who I'm like wow you know do you you know I, I actually reread one recently and I was like that is so surreal I mean if people knew what they'd sent I'd be embarrassed if I ever sent an email like that completely embarrassed and I think those are the things that hurt because you put a lot of energy into those relationships over a period of many years and I think it's sacrificing those relationships but as Jennifer said it's also opening up your heart to welcome in new relationships. And once you do that, it makes a huge difference. And you realize that you're actually not alone. And you don't necessarily need the community to be as big as um, it may have been. Uh, for me, I've, you know, I've got some incredible supportive people around me in the community now. They look out for each other. I've got a very small, tight group that when I have moments when the fan club come at me, I can share with them in a very safe, secure space um, and just essentially have a bitch about it and just go, Ugh! and then it's like, okay, I've released that now, I'm all good, you know, and you just carry on. Um, 
and you've got to have that. You've got to have those people around you that you trust and um, and have each other's backs. And when you've got that, it makes a huge difference. And you just have to put all those other people, all those all that other hate in the rear view, um, because so, you can't. Go ahead. No, because you can't. You can't control them no more than they can control you. So. I was just going to ask you if your mob is called the fan club, what do you call that group of people around you that looks after you? <laughs> oh. You get the fan club and then you got, is it the A team? No, <laughs> I love it yeah. when a plan comes together. <laughs> yeah. No, I sometimes call them the inner circle. Um, ah, I've got good. a very good, yeah, I've got a very, very good friend and her nickname is uh, FBI because she's the one that sort of often will hunt stuff out and she finds things and she's great because she'll find things and she will, sometimes she'll share stuff with me if she thinks I need to be aware of it, but she's, yeah, she's incredible and she will hunt, hunt stuff out. So I don't have to, you know? I um, think that is a great strategy. And to your point, Maria, about like not reading all of it. Yeah, don't read if it. You don't can read it. Find someone. Yeah, find someone to catalog <laughs> that stuff for you. Who loves you? Who doesn't mind wading into the swamp, where it's not as personal for them to do that? And then maybe tell them. I'm speaking out loud for myself now, making a plan. <laughs> tell them only to let you know when it's a threat, if there's a threat that you need to know about. But just general hate. You don't need to read all that stuff. I was just going to say, how many text messages have I sent you over the months with uh, the three words, do not engage? Yeah. <laughs> I, need to get, I was, as you and Jennifer were talking, I'm like a mix of the two. Because yeah. Part of what we do with our channel and we do on Deprogrammed is talk about social justice ideology and try and expose it for what it is. And so for a long time, with, I still every once in a while get random social justice like hate, hate from someone from my social justice past most of that happened a few years ago now but every once in a while there'll be a new one and sometimes i will highlight those because i want people to see it like one of the more recent ones uh sometime in the past year was from uh, uh someone in at full screen which is a division of i think it was warner media group i'm, I'm blanking on which entertainment group but he had just been through a big diversity training and I guess what he decided to do at the end of the day was to get drunk and then message this random contact from a few years ago to tell me what a white supremacist I am. <laughs> and so that I did make public because, um, because I had had it back and forth with him uh, about it in the comments. And I just said, you know, I left your ideology. I left social justice because you, it, it tells you that we have to, it tells us that we have to judge and treat people differently on the basis of race. And the way that he replied is what the social justice people call teachable moment. He replied and said, we do have to treat people differently on the basis of race. And I'm like, thank you. That's, ex that's all I need to know. Screen cap, boom, this is what they're teaching people. So I, I'm somewhere in the middle. And um, when it comes to my individual fan club, uh, I do need to get better about not engaging. And I, I really appreciate that advice. And I've, I've gone over this a lot. So I, I want to wrap this up. We're trying to keep these episodes to an hour. And if there's any, anything we didn't cover just in this, if somebody's sending this to someone who's the subject of a, a mob right now, what would you tell them? What about, what would you tell Joe Rogan? This is happening Stop right now. Stop apologizing. Stop it. He didn't do anything wrong. He's a comedian. Like he can, comedians have freedom to just say whatever they want. And then even if, even if it is a truthful statement, they can be like, it's a joke. Like they have that ability as a comedian. So it doesn't matter. None of it matters. These no, people, I, they're not your fans anyway. No. And I would also to that, to that end too, if Spotify, I mean, I thought Spotify up until the apologies, because where are the apologies coming from? I mean, has he had pressure applied from him? to to make these apologies because that's what it has, kind of seems like the videos seem does, really they seem yeah it has different feel it yeah. yeah it has that feel about it and if that's the case if that pressure has been applied by spotify i'd be taking that hundred million from rumble and i'd be gone <laughs> that's what i'd be doing because he you know the reason they're doing this to him is he is so powerful i mean what is it 11 million listeners and viewers per episode 
I mean, good grief, there would be television executives that would give a right testicle to get those numbers, especially at CNN. You know, they he is he has created something really amazing and he's done it because he's prepared to have a conversation with anybody and be thoughtful and listen and and try to sort of cover a, a wider variety of topics and and he's grown across a period of time and he's created this loyal listenership base as Jen said why are you apologizing it's a journey you haven't done anything wrong so yeah I would be stop apologizing Maria did you have any final thoughts I just thought the whole Joe Rogan thing was kind of hilarious, like how Neil Young was threatening. <laughs> it's either him or me. And Spotify was like, we choose him. <laughs> but you see how even on that large scale, it plays out just like the the microcosm in the knitting world where they it 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 grows. They loop other people in the same way people were calling everyone who had ever associated with you and done business with you. Then all this pressure starts to get put on other artists and Joni Mitchell says her thing. And then um, they start tagging people like Taylor, like really popular and younger artists and trying to get them to join in. And so Brené Brown, the podcaster, Brené Brown joined the fray. And, and so the more people they can pull in, then it gives it credibility. It gives the mob credibility and, even the way it was playing out was so similar. I'm like, this is, it's always yep. the same thing. That's and exactly we'll what I was feeling you. too. I was watching this whole time. I'm like, dude, this is, I am just this little tiny seamstress in the weird corner of Las Vegas. And this is exactly what happened to me. And I'm like, this is bizarre. This whole event, it was just spot on. If I could, if I could just change all the names of the people, you know, like it was, it's weird. It's weird, but that's what they do. They have a tactic. And that's why I don't think any of this is by accident. They want Joe Rogan out. So this is what they're going to do. They're going to get him, get him, get him. And when none of that stuff sticks, we're going to throw the race card. You know, that's, they want I, him out because it's conversations. He's making it easy. It's He's making it easy for people to talk to other people, honestly. Like having those conversations, it's not hard. It's not hard to say, hey, when you're in the line at a grocery store, I do it all the time. Everybody's got masks on. We still have mask mandates here. And I'll just turn around and just start talking. And by the end, by the time I'm checking out, they have their mask off and we are engaging each other in just nonsense, just having a conversation. People don't talk to each other anymore. And I think that's one of the big things with the Joe Rogan thing is he's talking to people. He's having these four hour conversations, you know, and they don't want people to do that. Yes. I was gonna say too, I think that a lot of these people like Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, like most of this generation now has no idea who they are. And they're probably feeling that. They're probably jealous that Joe Rogan is getting all this attention. And also COVID, at least for me, has really like destroyed any, um, uh any positive feelings i had or admiration for celebrities is just like mostly wiped out like i could care less about hollywood i don't care what any of them say anymore like it has really revealed how corrupt they all are because they all say the exact same thing they're all going along with this and like I could care less, most of the musicians that I used to used to listen to and movies and actors, like I can't even stand mm. listening to them anymore. It's totally like destroyed their reputation in my mind. So I don't know, maybe, maybe they're feeling that as well. I some of it from the some of it from the newscasters anyway. Uh, like Brian Stelter, you know, who's going after him and saying he's misinformation from CNN, mind you, the network of misinformation, the network of Russiagate, right? Um, do you remember, hold on, do if you, you remember when they did the, uh, back in the 90s, they had the green screen and it was, I think it was the Gulf War and they got caught faking it. We had a 
potted plant sitting there behind in the green screen. Oh, I don't, think I don't remember that. That but... was like when they were first brand new. <laughs> so they've been they've been misinformation since the beginning. From the beginning, kind of yeah. like the New York Times and Walter yeah. Durante. Um, <laughs> but I just pulled up their numbers. I'm sure you guys saw this graph moving around. But it, it just in terms of to your point, Marie, the ratings. I mean, Joe Rogan's getting 11 million per episode, and then some of these people trying to pull them down. Um, like they don't even have 1 million CNN primetime doesn't even get 1 million. So the, the read, the resentfulness is there. It's the same thing in the knitting world or in the fiber fiber community. Is that what you call it? Seam, your seamstress world. Um, <laughs> but people, a lot of it is fueled by resentment and mm -hmm. it's like, let's go after these people who have built something and tear them down and try and pull ourselves up at the same time. And, and now and if you're okay. in business, you know, d don't be afraid to stand up for yourself, as Jennifer said, but also to, by carrying on, that is, you know, that is a create courageous act in itself. And courage is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. So you just start doing one small thing, and that might be not apologizing. And then the next thing would be, I'll ne I, actually, I'll never forget when the, the attack with me was at its most worst like that one particular day was hideous like really hideous and I was just felt like an absolute wreck and the following day I had to do a live broadcast and I just was not you know and you could probably appreciate this Carrie you just there are days that you think the last thing I want to do is slap a smile on my face and talk to you know four or five hundred people about um knitting and stuff and I um and I did that because I thought, no, because this is why they're here. This is why they're coming. So I did that and I slapped a smile on my dial and I got out there and I got through the show and I finished it all up. And a, a person who has a show in Australia that I know, and she sent me a, um, a, PM, a DM and just said to me, you don't know who I am. I've been following what's been happening to you. And I tuned into your YouTube channel to see what you would do. And I've just messaged you to tell you, you did exactly what you needed to do and to congratulate you for just carrying on as if nothing had happened, because that will affect them more than anything on earth. And I really appreciated that advice. And so whenever it happens now, I always channel that message I had from, uh, from that podcaster going, yeah, I just, because this is why people are here. They're not here to hear the drama. And if they are, yeah. they've come to the wrong channel. Yeah, you're right. So there's, there's something that Joe Rogan said on uh, Jordan Peterson when he was talking with him. And I wish he would just listen to himself because he said it, that these people, the online mobs, they are wannabe influencers. They're wannabe in the position. He said it way better than this, but they want to be in the position of the person they're taking down. So they're like just using it as a stepping stone to gain influence, right? So if he could just remember that himself. So if Joe Rogan, you're out there, listen to your own words. <laughs> Because these people are like, like Carrie, you're saying when you're reading their, uh, what was it, their their numbers, their rating numbers, how low mm. they were compared to his, they just wish, that is that jealousy, that envy, they just wish that they were popular again or ever, right? And I think some of it is not, is not just the, um, by the way, apologies, I'm still figuring out the light in this new setup and now I don't know if it's better or worse to leave this. We're just going to leave this light going, <laughs> this yellow light. <laughs> but um, uh, I think part of it is not just that they envy success if people want to bring them down. It's not just that resentment. It's also they envy the freedom. If you are a person who has shown that the mob can't control you, if you've already illustrated that, then there's this extra resentment they, they're going to have for you because they see you operating in freedom and joy and not being constrained by the same things. And that's really unnerving to someone who is in a prison of their own making. It's because it, it, it calls into question the whole path that they've chosen, which is to be beholden to this ideology or this cult or this mob or these restrictions. And, and you're showing that you don't have to do that. So I think some of it's like a weird, like spiritual or psychological battle happening within them of of you know your very existence when they say when they say your very existence what is it invalidates their existence in a way they're being honest they feel invalidated by you so yeah okay. they're like why I, do i have to be controlled by this and you're just out there doing whatever you yeah know?
Exactly. What makes you special in that way? Courage. Mm -hmm. Like Marie said, it grows. So, well, I, I just want to thank you guys so much for being here to talk about this. We're going to send this out. If you're watching and you are going through mobbing, reach out to someone who's been through it. Um, you know, find even in the comments on this video, find some of the interviews we've done, build that community around you. If you don't already have it of people who understand and who've been there. And um, I'm sure I'm not, well, actually, I'm not, I don't want to speak for you. Maybe these ladies don't want to talk to you, but, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they do reach out to someone. You don't know, find someone who's been through it and, and ask them, you know, advice. And if you're watching and you um, are a, a fan of this video and you like what we had to say, send this to someone and help us get the word out. And uh, anyway, thank you guys so much. I'm going to put in the description where everybody can find you. But if yeah. you want to just tell people again, like, where can they find you online if they want to find your company? Yeah, so for me, Skeins, S-K-E-I-N-Z. Uh, and then we've got Skeins.com, uh, Facebook and YouTube. And if you do want to email me, if you are being mobbed, info at Skeins.com. I'm more than happy to walk you through anything. Hi, Little Ragamuffin. So littleragamuffin.com. Um, social media is just Lil, L-I-L, Ragamuffin. Um, Facebook, I think my biggest, my biggest um, group is in my Facebook group and it's over like 12,000 now or something. So if you want to sew and come and hang out there, it's Ragamuffin Patterns on Facebook groups. Um, I have my YouTube channel um, and we're doing a giveaway right now. I'm going to throw that out there. If you want to join my giveaway, you can win a $25 shop credit. <laughs> And if you need any advice, I'm happy to uh, talk to you as well. So just inbox me wherever. <laughs> and I am Tuscan Knits. I'm mostly active on Instagram um, and then my website, TuscanKnits.com. Um, yeah, if you want to reach out, I do get emails occasionally from um, people uh, kind of in a similar position or thinking about going into this position and speaking their mind. So that would be uh, Maria at TuscanKnits.com. And I also have YouTube. It's Maria Tuscan. Um, I've been posting on there a little bit more with knitting content. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Cool. Thank you, ladies. Thanks for being a part of this episode. And that's a wrap. Mm -hmm.